It is now my honor and privilege to introduce the recipient of this year's Dwight D. Eisenhower Award, retired Marine Corps General James N. Mattis. The general hails from Washington State and would enlist in the United States Marine Corps in 1969 before finishing college and earning his commission as a second lieutenant in 1972. He would go on to command a rifle and weapons platoon and company, the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines during the first Gulf War, the 7th Marine Regiment, the 1st Marine Expeditionary Brigade, and Task Force 58 during the war in Afghanistan, the 1st Marine Division during the 2003 invasion of Iraq, and subsequent stability operations to include the April 2004 Battle of Fallujah, and then command the Marine Corps Combat Deve Development Command and the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force. After being confirmed as a four-star general in 2007, he commanded Joint Forces Command, then in 2010, U.S. Central Command, which oversaw the conduct of both wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. General Mattis is admired in the Corps as a Marine's Marine, someone who always took care of his Marines, such as when he was a Brigadier General at Quantico, he stood watch as the officer of the day, a young major, could be at home with his family on Christmas. In that same vein, he also never hesitated to replace ineffective field commanders. General Mattis retired in 2013 with more than 41 years of service, but he would retire with one regret, that he couldn't serve longer. Today, he still serves by ensuring America's military remains the best, that our intelligent resources remain clear-eyed, and that our elected officials hear the unvarnished truth. He also wants to destroy the PTSD victim myth. In April 2014, he spoke to a group of OEF and OIF veterans in San Francisco about how in America the victim who's glorified. This nation has a disease orientation, he said. You've been told that you are broken, that you are damaged goods, and should be labeled as victims of two unjust and poorly executed wars. And when the problem is, he said, especially when we hear it enough, is that we start believing it. Whereas the truth is that we are the only folks with the skills, determination, and values to ensure American dominance in this chaotic world. The general now counters PTSD with post-traumatic growth. When you come back from war stronger and much more sure of yourself. The Dwight D. Eisenhower Award has been presented annually since 1970 to one individual for his or her contributions to American security, unity, and world peace. It recognizes extraordinary, con extraordinary contributions and achievements to secure the nation from foreign threats, to advance the interests of the nation abroad, and to inspire the American public to support these efforts. Comrades, sisters, and distinguished guests, please welcome the recipient of this year's Dwight D. Eisenhower Award, retired Marine Corps General James Mattis. In special recognition and sincere appreciation of more than four decades of honorable and exceptional service to his country for command, commanding United States Marines in battle from Operation Desert Storm and during freedom and Iraqi freedom to overseeing the conduct of all foreign forces in Afghanistan and Iraq as commander of U.S. Central Command. By taking the fight directly to the enemy, he served our nation and a few others have. His dedication to mission accomplishment and to those who carry out his orders is true to the ideals, traditions, and values of the veteran of foreign wars of the United States. In witness whereof, we have hereunto set the, our hands in the official seal of the veteran of foreign wars of the United States this 20th day of July, 2015, approved by the National Council of Administration, 
signed by John W. Stout, Commander-in-Chief, and John E. Hamilton, Adjutant General. Well, thank all of you high-spirited veterans of foreign wars, uh, Commander-in-Chief John Stroud and Pantelikos, the National President of the Ladies Auxiliary. Uh, frankly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, after some of my publicized remarks, I find it an honor to be invited to speak in front of any polite company anymore. Uh, but I do come to here, here today to, to pay my respects to you and to pay my respects uh, for who you are and for what you represent to our country. And of course, as you will understand, to humbly accept an award that really was not won by me, but by veterans like you. Our America has two significant powers. The first is the power of inspiration, and the second is the power of intimidation. And that's where you come in. For an imp in an imperfect world, America must be seen for what it is. And that is a revolutionary experiment, ladies and gentlemen, to determine if a government of the people, by the people, and for the people can endure and can pass on its freedoms intact to the next generation. For most of us, for most of us, we were born in this country completely by accident. And we all live in this country by choice. Yet we have an obligation to turn over intact to the next generation the same freedoms that you and I enjoy. And that is where you come in to the never-ending equation of freedom. You who have carried the Patriot's burden, you who have carried out your patriotic chore, you who rallied to the flag and answered your country's call when it was in its most, most in peril, you were the ones who signed a blank check to the American people, payable with your lives. And that's a reality that you and I have seen in far too often in our lost buddies, our comrades, our shipmates who made the ultimate sacrifice. Here among warriors, I'm very comfortable. You are unapologetic about America's values and about what you will do to defend those. And I can only accept the Eisenhower Award on behalf of soldiers sailors, airmen, coast guardsmen, and marines who I was privileged to serve alongside. And alongside each other, we are all co-equal, regardless of our rank, in defense of the Constitution, in defense of our people, and in defense of the values that we hold so dear. And you will understand why I was absolutely amazed that the marines allowed me to stand in the ranks for so many years, 40-odd years, alongside the most selfless, the most rambunctious, the most ferocious, and the most ethical fighters in the world. And while you and I know we're not the perfect guys, we are the good guys. I leave perfection to God, but we are the good guys, and it was an absolute delight to serve alongside all of you. And it's an honor to march and sail alongside sailors and Marines for most of my career, eventually soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, I would just tell you we were carrying on your legacy. Because in a magnificent country, but we have one that's always striving to improve by listening to what President Lincoln called our better angels. It's a country trying to rediscover right now its fundamental unity and its fundamental friendships with one another. Our country men and women need only to look at the military that you veterans made better by your service a military that takes pride in each other's success on the battlefield where the cost is dear. As a people, the American people need only to look to you to see an America that's never complacent, always striving to live up to its ideals, an America that remains the greatest beacon of hope and freedom for all mankind. At a time when Russia has regressed and chosen to become a threat once again, invading European countries and right, flying nuclear-capable bombers off California, where I live, at a time when Chinese bullying in the South China Sea has them seeking a veto power over other nations' sovereignty, when nuclear-armed North Korea rattles its saber to gain attention for its bankrupt ideology, 
and when merciless terrorists murder the innocent and proclaim our freedoms a threat to their tyranny, we see the threats that history tells us will always confront America in one form or another. Yet inexplicably, in the midst of all this, we advise our enemies in advance what we won't do. Our Congress, paralyzed by a lack of compromise, cannot repeal mindless sequestration that is doing more damage to our military today than any foe in the field. And even, and even in the face of these threats, we shrink our military, yet we are not reducing our treaty commitments overseas, leaving us with a strategic mismatch between our stated political ends and our military means. So the military you fought in today must be prepared to buy time when danger looms, buy time for America. Until America can get back on a sustainable financial footing, can fully re-energize our economy, can regain its fundamental unity and that all-important friendliness between us all in our wonderfully argumentative democracy. Our military is getting smaller, so it's inevitable that we must do less with it. And yet at the same time, it's essential that when the Commander-in-Chief, whoever he or she is, makes the commitment of our troops overseas, commitments that you have carried out yourselves, we must make certain that when that happens, it's the enemy's longest day and the enemy's worst day. And that is why I'm here. And that brings me to why I am here to pay my deepest respects and show you my gratitude for your record in past battles reminds today's troops that nothing they face can be worse than what you faced, you and your predecessors. That today's troops carry that legacy stretching from the Battle of the Bulge to Ploesti, from Midway to Porkchop Hill, from Guadalcanal to Hamburger Hill, to Fallujah in Iraq, and to the Helmand River Valley in Afghanistan. Having ordered many troops into a fight, I owe you for your stoicism and your courage. You know, on 9-11, those maniacs thought they could hurt us and that would scare us. That by killing thousands of innocent people in New York City, here in Pennsylvania, and in Washington, D.C., killing the citizens, innocent people, from 70 different countries who are in America, they thought they could strike fear into us. But the military you created in your battles gave proof that we don't scare, that the descendants of Bunker Hill, of bloody Shiloh, that the descendants of Bunker Hill, of bloody Shiloh, both sides, Bella Wood, Iwo Jima, Quezon, thousands of other battles, we prove today that Americans are not made of cotton candy. We are worthy descendants in the tradition that you veterans of foreign wars made by your service and showed the world that America retains an awesome determination to defend herself. To show you my respect for your example, is built on reality. Let me relate an experience I had, one which illustrates the depth of what today's military owes each of you. In early April 2004, as our Commander-in-Chief John Stroud just mentioned, I was in an organization ordered to attack Fallujah. It would turn out to be the bloodiest battle for the Marines since Hue City, Vietnam. And for the soldiers, sailors, and Marines who fought that battle, it was going to be a very tough one. The night before the battle, I went down to visit the assault battalions, and about midnight, it's time for generals to get out of the way and leave it in the hands of the infantry, the infant soldier, young soldier, that's how they got their name. And as I was falling back with my half dozen radio operators to my vehicles, the enemy created some mischief nearby. We were, laying, we were behind a company laying on the line of departure. It was quite chilly. They didn't have sleeping bags. They were stripped down to their assault gear. And this company would attack before dawn in order to clear the enemy outposts so the rest of the battalion could move into the town. And the enemy uh, started some mischief, and I checked in with the corporal, and he said, no sweat, General, we'll take care of it. 
and after it all died down, we lay there for a few minutes to make sure it was quiet before we moved on. And one of the young Marines asked his corporal, who probably the corporal himself wasn't old enough to buy a beer legally. Notice I said legally. The young man asked the corporal, Corporal, do you think Fallujah is going to be rough? And we have ladies present, so I'm not going to put the uh, response quite in the terms of a Marine corporal, but he said basically, hush and get some rest. We took Iwo Jima, Fallujah won't be nothing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, as you will understand more than any other group I could ever talk to, generals can give brave speeches, and we can do everything we possible to have the ammunition stacked up and the artillery ready to fire, but eventually your example is worth more than all the gold in Fort Knox when troops are laying on the line of departure and they're shivering from more than just the cold. Now, I may not know each of you personally, yet I do know your character. Like today's young patriots who look past the hot political rhetoric of poorly explained wars and signed on, in this imperfect world, when the still radical idea of a free people governing themselves with respect for each other's differences is such a frightful notion for those intimidated by our freedom, in such a world as this, your example of individual service, of your willingness to face danger and discomfort, again, that example is worth more than anything else when the troops are ready to go. For even on its worst day, the, our military remains the envy of the world. It's the fiercest, it's the most ethical, and it was an honor to serve in, as you all know. It was by your service that you made it so, that you made these attributes of ferocity and courage a reality by keeping the faith and staying loyal in the tough times. And that's the only time that loyalty really matters. So it's no surprise that you enjoy the respect and the affections of a nation so very, very proud of you. Thank you for allowing me to join you here in Pittsburgh, I will never forget the irredeemable debt that I owe you magnificent veterans. And what I say now, of course, will surprise none of you here, for you and I are cut from the same cloth. I accept the Eisenhower Award on behalf of the troops who earned my place here today, earned my place with their blood and their sweat, and all too often the Gold Star families who earned this place that I occupy with their tears. Thank you, veterans of foreign wars, and we say in the U.S. Marines, Semper Fi. I believe that's what they call a Marine's Marine. General, thanks for being with us.